Hi, this is Tim Hamilton, the co-host of the Maryland Crabs, and I'm here with a crab cake for your listening pleasure. What's a crab cake? Well, it's not quite a full episode. It's just a little snippet. Stay tuned and check it out. Make sure you check us out on themarylandcrabs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast or find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Don't forget, subscribe, rate us, iTunes. Go there now. Hey, is this Soren Baker? That's me. Hey, Soren, it's Tim Hamilton. I'm calling from the Maryland Crabs Podcast here in Annapolis. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Great. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. We love having you. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, your Gambrel's boy made good, right? Yep. I was uh, born in Silver Spring, stayed there about one or two days in the hospital, and then moved to Gambrel's, where I was raised until I moved to California when I was in uh, 22. So I was basically born and raised in Gambrel's, essentially. One or two days in Silver Spring, and you were pretty much done with it. Oh, yeah. Down yeah. with Gambrels, baby. It's all about Gambrels. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in L.A. now, huh? Yeah, I've, I've been uh, based in L.A. since uh, 2003, and I had a stint out here before that from 98 to 2000. Took a brief detour to go to Chicago and then came back. You're now a West Coast boy at heart, huh? Well, I was trying to figure out recently, I guess whenever I've lived in California more than I've lived in Maryland, I'll switch. But at right. this point... I'm still Maryland, but it's not by much. But you can't get a crab out there. Not a decent one. No, not on not on the level that we have at home, man. Maryland, <laughs> far and away, even by some of the seafood foodies and connoisseurs that I've met over the years, they all tip the hat to Maryland. So something to be definitely be proud of. And even though the pizza in Maryland's nothing to write home about, the pizza in L.A., any good? L.A., the great thing about L.A., man, is if you have money, you can get pretty much anything you want. So there's definitely a lot of great pizza out here. You know, I think Chicago definitely has some of the best that I've had, but with the advent of a lot of the create-your-own type of pizza restaurants, there's several of them here, both independent and chains, that uh, you can get a wide array of food, and high-quality pizza is among that here in Los Angeles now. The thing I could never get used to in L.A. was the sprawl. Like when we would land at LAX and we'd catch a cab before Uber and you'd be in the cab for like a half hour, 45 minutes, and you're just waiting to get there. And then all of a sudden you're like, there's no there to get to. It just rambles on forever. It just, that's the yeah, one part of LA that got me that there was no center. The irony of that is LA is the most densely populated urban area in America and it's so spread out. Because there's a bunch so, of cities on top of each other, essentially. It's hard for us to understand here, but I mean, out there, because you think of Los Angeles, but it's a bunch of cities just mashed together, right? Yeah. L.A. County is massive. And, you know, you have to remember, L.A. County includes, you got Los Angeles, you got Santa Monica, you have Pasadena, you have Burbank, you have Long Beach, you have Compton, you have all these different cities that are all part of Los Angeles County and also the L.A. metropolitan area. And when you talk about Compton, of course, the thing, first thing you think is N.W.A., right? Which is why we have you here. Yeah, I'm definitely glad for that, man. N.W.A. and Easy E. They definitely, and also I have to remember to shout out King T as always. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that really put Compton on the map. So we're talking to Soren Baker, and Soren is the author, uh, which was just released in October, I believe, The History of Gangster Rap from Schooly D to Kendrick Lamar, The Rise of a Great American Art Form. That's on Amazon, I believe, and you're doing kind of a book tour right now. You're, do you're going from place to place where you're kind of meeting people and talking? Yeah, I've done several appearances in Los Angeles. I just had one in Bowie at the Barnes & Noble at the Bowie Town Center, and then I'm scheduling events. Uh, we're booking them now for Atlanta and New York, and then I just met with some people today that were interested in bringing me to some other locations and I'm probably and hopefully going to be doing some with Schooly D at the hopefully at the beginning of next year in a few different cities so you know that's a lot of movement and excitement and momentum going on with the book so I'm I'm out and about promoting it. So Soren is a writer so you've done like 3,000 plus articles so you've done everything from the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, uh, The Source and you've done it on hip-hop as well as sports? Yes, I've done a lot of sports writing, but once my writing in the rap world really took off and rap is my favorite thing in the world, I really just stayed with that and focused on that. And, you know, once you 
are having a lot of success, I always made a point as I was writing for The Source and even the LA Times and other places, I would always try to do sports writing and I would do it. I would get some assignments or I would try to find the blend of sports and music or sports and entertainment. But with some of the publications, they really, especially the more mainstream ones at the time, like the LA Times, they, you know, they're they have their own departments and they want you to focus on it. So being that rap was my favorite thing and I was most interested in it and having success with that, uh, that's what I focused on. So you're about five years younger than I am. And I remember I got into hip hop like everyone else did in the early eighties. It was Sugar Hill Gang and Run DMC and, uh, you know, eventually Beastie Boys, which is almost a satire group at the time. But it wasn't until I got to college when uh, gangster rap kind of exploded on the mainstream. But I would say that even rap had just become mainstream, but not even too mainstream. In most, a lot of cities around the country, you wouldn't hear it. And that's when uh, Straight Outta Compton came out. Um, and then Ghetto Boys, We Can't Be Stopped was, was another big one when I was in college. And it's not gangster rap, but what, what set me off onto that kind of angrier side of rap that wasn't like a young MC or uh, even my favorite, which is Tribe Called Quest. But it was Fear of a Black Planet. Public Enemy, which which actually I think Cream Magazine named as one of the top 10 punk albums of the 80s. But what was the evolution into uh, gangster rap hitting the mainstream? I mean, I'm assuming like anything else, it was underground for years before all of a sudden it was discovered by a mainstream audience, which generally means white, right? Yes. So the main thing, the main events that took place were you had Schooly D came out in 1985 with his single PSK. What Does It Mean? And the B-side of that was Gucci Time. Those are two of the most sampled songs in rap history. And Ice-T heard those songs, PSK in particular, and then in 1986 came out with Six in the Morning. And I talk about this in my book, The History of Gangster Rap. I get some great anecdotes and stories because I interviewed both Schooly D and Ice-T for the book. And Ice-T talked about how PSK influenced him and how he put in a call to Schooly D to get his blessing to release it because he was directly influenced by Schooly D. And from there, you have the next major song the following year was Boys in the Hood by Easy e and that set up what Easy e and N.W.A. would become. And Easy e and N.W.A. are the ones that really, and Ice-T as well, those three really broke gangster rap as it was about to be called in, starting in around 1989 that's what really got gangster rap popular because at the time, and I have a nice sidebar about this in the book, but a lot of the artists, they prefer to be called reality rap or street reporters, and they don't necessarily gravitate toward the term gangster rap, but as it became more popular, the media as it does likes to label and define things, and that's how when the name was coined in 1989, by one of my mentors, Bob Hilburn from the LA Times, that's when the genre also was solidified by the media, which gave it something for the fans, the listeners, the people that were watching the MTV raps and Rap City, something they could latch onto. And then, of course, America's affinity with gangsterism in general definitely helped, I think, make it not only appeal to the young, but offend the the older. Well, so. and then Color, the movie Colors it was a pretty big hit. That was probably 89 or 90, and Ice-T did the theme for that as well, which was a pretty big song. Oh, yeah. But uh, as I talk about in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, Colors is different, though, because it definitely exposed a lot of people to the gang, the black street gangs in Los Angeles. But at the same time, it was told and focused much more on the police officers, and they were very removed from that culture with Sean Penn and Robert Duvall. So when you have, in 1991, you have New Jack City and you have Boys in the Hood come out in particular with Boys in the Hood being set and based around what was going on in the gang world of the Bloods and the Crips in Los Angeles, that was far more significant in the grand scheme of things because it focused on the young black men that were directly and indirectly involved in this, the gangs and the ones that were the ones that were the rappers of the world. And not coincidentally, Ice Cube playing Doughboy was one of the characters in the, or portrayed one of the characters in the film, which then, you know, launched his acting career and also 
that same year he had his death certificate album and it just showed right there the blurring lines of art and reality and that all these things happening at around the same time and in very quick succession really helped gangster rap explode and become a dominant force in in not only rap and music but in entertainment and schooly d he was from philly right or new york philly He's from Philadelphia. Right. So why did gangster rap seem to be more of a, at least at first, to be a West Coast phenomenon? I mean, because I, I think you were, you were seeing the same. You had the poverty. You had the clashes with the police. You had the social injustice. Uh, a matter of fact, if I think about that time, if people think that race relations are bad right now, I think of, you know, the late 80s when you had, you know, Tawana Brawley and Al Sharpton and The Wilding and Central Park Five and just it, it was and Bonfire of the Vanities had just come out at that point, the, the book, Tom Wolfe. And race relations were particularly bad at that time uh, on the West Coast as well as the East Coast. Why did it seem to be more of a West Coast phenomenon? I think it's because in New York, one, there weren't the gangs that they had in New York were very different and they weren't as, I'd say, integral or significant in the overall culture of the city. But the thing is, is that the artists and it's interesting, even before I worked on the book, just over the course of my life and listening and, and interviewing artists leading up to my writing the history of gangster rap a lot of the rappers in new york and dana dane is one i can refer to specifically and cool keith from ultra magnetic they both told me multiple times over the years that they grew up in terrible environments dana dane grew up in brooklyn and and cool keith was in the bronx but they were like we didn't want to write about that because we didn't want to think about that that was our reality and we were around guys that were selling drugs doing drugs shooting people stabbing people they wanted to get away from that. And then you have in South Central Los Angeles and, you know, the Comptons, the Englewoods, the Watts of the world, those guys, that was the life because the gangs at that time were so pervasive and so integrated into the whole society of what was going on, thanks not only to territory, but because of the influx of drugs and guns and money, that was the life. You couldn't it was difficult to escape it for the average person. So these guys are products of that environment where that environment was dominated by the gangs. So naturally the artists, you know, once you get the ice T's and the easy E's and the NWA's they're around that environment, but it even took them a while to be overt and be explicit in identifying the gangs. They still reported and talked about what was going on, but, if you notice, and I talk about this in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, Ice-T, Easy e and N.W.A., if you look back, most of their attire was very neutral. They didn't wear the blue for the Crips or red for the Bloods in a lot of their early videos and songs and stuff. They usually wore black, and that was a conscious decision to not, A, identify themselves as what they were affiliated with in Los Angeles, but it was also a marketing move to make sure that they didn't alienate, you know, different sets or gangs in Los Angeles. Because at that time, there was obviously no internet and there certainly was no music sharing. This was, you know, probably 10 years before Napster. So at that point, I think in public housing in in low-income areas like Watson, Englewood and what have you, is, is that you would have just, they'd pass around the tapes. It was a very physical relationship with the music. You know, so it was, yeah. it was, so it was kind of uh, viral before there was any sort of internet. Oh yeah. That's, um, you know, when I was growing up in Maryland, man, we would have the cassettes and if my sure. friends, you know, I couldn't afford to buy every album that I wanted. So you would dub it on a cassette or somebody would get the CD and you'd record it and get it on cassette off the CD or off the vinyl. And that was obviously going on around the country. So that it, was original underground network. And it was a big boom for suburban white boys, white men like like you and I, where we were completely separated from the culture, and it was fascinating. I mean, I like to say that you know people. I would like to say that people were shocked by what they were hearing about the way other people were living, and they just had no idea. But it became kind of a glorification of that, which was the accusations a lot of critics had it. I think the PMRC, I think there was a, what was that the Parents uh, Music Parent Parental Music Resource Council, that was Tipper Gore. They're the ones who sued Two Live Crew or they pressed charges against Two Live Crew. But that was their accusation was that this was not so much a depiction of what these people were going through or a, a telling, a reporting, but it was the glorification of that. 
Yeah, and I think that's a very unfortunate conclusion that a lot of those people came to and a lot of those organizations came to. And I, you know, explain a lot of this in my book, The History of Gangster Rap. I have a sidebar about the PMRC and talk about that very issue and the very issue that a lot of people think that gangster rap is mindless and that it doesn't have a point. But the premier artists in gangster rap, when you look at the Ice T's and the Ice Cubes and the Snoop Dogs and the Dr. Dre's and the NWA's and the Schooly V's, the Compton's Most Wanted, the DJ Quicks of the early waves of gangster rap, they all included several cautionary tales. It was not a glorification. If you listen to Dope Man, oh, which great. is, you know, that's clearly denouncing a drug dealer. And it's talking about how drugs and the drug culture ravaged the community that Ice Cube is growing up in. That's not glorifying it. And people, I noticed, were always thrown off by the language and the violence depicted and the subject matter, but it doesn't, you know, they looked at that and didn't pay attention to what the artists were actually saying. And that, to me, is the problem, because we'll look at other forms of art and don't hold it to the same standard that we've held rap. So I don't know if that's because it's music, if that's because it's rap, if that's because it's the language, or if it's because it's made by young black men, all the above, some of the above, other reasons. But the bottom line is, if you listen to the music and the stories that are being told, these are not especially by the better artists, they're not glorifying it. They're talking about the pitfalls and how, you know, your brother's going to get shot, your mom's going to go to jail, and you're going to get addicted to drugs, or your girlfriend who's pregnant is going to get killed by a drug dealer that you owe money to. These are not positive outcomes. These are not things glorifying it. It's all about the downfalls of it. And sure, you can succeed for a while, and Ice-T has a song called Pain, you know, it's it's fun in the beginning to a pain in the end. And the allure of gangsterism and the gangster lifestyle is just that. It can suck you in, but then, as we've seen time and time again, it just spits you out. And there's very few examples of people that are in it and deep into it and then are end up able to live, like, safe, sane, normal, productive lifestyles, they usually something catastrophic happens to them. Well, Ghetto Boys, uh, Mind's Playing Tricks on Me, that is a perfect illustration of that. That's a really sad song. That's just about uh, loneliness, isolation, paranoia, um, just right. a sense of doom, depression, all in the song. That that is, if you, that is a cautionary tale. And it's their most popular song by far. Yeah, and there's something kind of beautiful about it in, in a stark reality, just, you know, because it's, it is the anti-glorification. You know, they're not talking about stacks. They're not talking about the crisscross. They're not talking about, you know, crisscross craft, whatever. But they're not talking about what they're, they're reaping from, from the lifestyle. It's a, it's a sad song. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, with the Ghetto Boys, Scarface in particular, you know, he discusses paranoia and doubt and confusion and depression. And a lot of the gangster rappers do that. And that's, again, not a glorification. It's quite the contrary it's like if these are the choices you make or these are the situations you find yourselves in either how can you get out and walk away or you know how do you deal with it and try to survive while you're in the midst of this chaos and that's the thing that i think a lot of the critics and people who are vehemently opposed to gangster rap miss and again i know that the language some people find objectionable or offensive but that kind of you know we also embrace and look at a lot of movies just on the language level that contain plenty of profanity and, and look at these as classic movies in white mainstream culture and i think we should afford the same level of respect to a lot of gangster rap or comedy you know that we, we talk about that a lot you know some of the some of the best comedians i know but they, they dabble in in language because it's just a tool that they use right now do you find that if you look back that that maybe it's it's painted with too broad a brush what falls into the category of gangster rap is that especially for you know anyone who was critical of it that they just kind of lumped everything into it i just talked about two live crew who i wouldn't call gangster rap i mean they just they had the language they were funny they're almost a novelty group but um even tupac you know he got his start with um digital underground and you know later he kind of he kind of evolved you know but um do you find that the the, the term's overused absolutely in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, I have in my introduction and then in a few different chapters, I explain 
my definition that I use to frame the book. And that's basically if you're talking about actual gang banging and you were inspired or you were directly or indirectly inspired by it and it was reflected in your music. So a lot of the mafioso criminal rap or guys that were just talking about robbing people like that's not being a gangster. So or not a gangster rapper because the gangster rappers are typically affiliated with a gang, a street gang. They're not affiliated with, you know, uh, one or two guys going out and robbing people in a parking lot or something. These are actual organizations they're part of. And that being said, a lot of people only look at it in Southern California, but there's plenty of gangster rap that's made in Chicago that reflects their gangs and, you know, throughout the rest of the Midwest and even in the South. And that's why in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, I talk about the Chicago gangster rap movement and I interviewed Gangster Boo from 3-6 Mafia because they have a lot of gangster elements and mention gang stuff in their music. And it's just interesting that on the one hand, it's used way too loosely, but then on the other hand, people only look at it in a narrow term. So it's somewhat paradoxical, in my opinion. Are there differences in or subtleties in levels and layers within gangster rap where, I mean, if you look at rock, you have like, you know, the Southern California sound, Southern rock, punk was generally an East Coast phenomenon and, and from the UK. But, uh, you know, so you can't say rock. You say that there's different levels. And I know that's, just, that's the same with hip hop. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of the native tongues. I loved uh, Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul and Black Sheep and all those. But, you know, I, but then I would, and I loved, I loved Public Enemy. But then I'd stray off in the gangster rap, but I didn't live there that often. But there was different, there was different layers of, of rap. Are there different categories of gangster rap? Are there differences between New York, LA, Chicago? Yeah, absolutely. When you, uh, Look at the gangster rap from Southern California in particular, a lot of it sonically, some of the classic material is based off of the Roger Troutman or the Parliament Funkadelic stuff that NWA used early and and then Above the Law, uh, DJ Quick and a bunch of other people, um, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg and many, many dozens of others used um, extensively, but then you also, when you go to Chicago, most of that stuff is either using other samples or is keyboard driven, similarly in the South. So the sound is very different. And I also talk about in the History of Gangster Rap book with the mob music out of Northern California, the Bay Area that was introduced through E40 to where it's more slow and the synthesizers and the high end sounds and the keyboards like it's interesting in the different genres of rock like they had the grunge in the seattle sound well most cities in rap and even different sections of cities have their own sounds in rap and within gangster rap in particular so yes that definitely exists and i detail and explain that in my book the history of gangster rap so we're like two middle-aged white guys at this point i'm more so than you i mean you're just entering it but uh so we're doing that thing where you look back and say well the music today sucks when compared to our music but you know you find gems here and there but i mean i kind of stopped listening to hip-hop any new hip-hop you know pat i mean eminem of course because i'm a white guy but i mean and i'll hear some things uh that my kids listen to and i'll be like all right i kind of like that but i haven't bought anything myself do you think that it's just as relevant now or do you think gangster rap is just as relevant now as it was say you know 25 years ago Absolutely. I think, unfortunately, the societal conditions that helped inspire the artists to create gangster rap, the social and economic inequities, the police brutality, the pervasive drugs in black ghettos throughout the United States, all of that stuff still is relevant and unfortunately alive and well today. And we see that reflected in the music of some of the artists that I think are the best modern gangster rappers. I think Vince Staples hmm. is the best. And then you also have people like G Perico. He was just in Baltimore actually performing on tour. And you have Schoolboy Q. Some people say, some people don't, but you have a Kendrick Lamar. You have AD. You have YG. There's so many artists that are from, and those artists I'll mention are from Southern California. So just them alone, there's so many of them that are releasing high quality material that's very powerful and memorable. And they're able to talk about 
unfortunately, similar stories to what Schooly D, Ice T, Easy E, and NWA pioneered in the mid to late 1980s. Those societal conditions still exist. Uh, white America in general was shocked and seemingly surprised and startled by the Rodney King incident, but that's the type of behavior that NWA described on F the Police. So, and that song came out uh, about three years prior to Rodney King. And when NWA was writing about it, they weren't the first ones to firsthand or secondhand experience that. So, you know, what rap has always done and what gangster rap in particular does so well is provide a voice to the voiceless and it exposes what society is doesn't want to talk about or is afraid to talk about or wishes wasn't happening. And that still sadly is happening today. The book's The History of Gangster Rap from Schooly D to Kendrick Lamar, The Rise of a Great American Art Form. So Soren, where do they get this? Yeah, you can get it at hopefully any bookstore, but Barnes & Noble in particular and Amazon.com. And then if you are in an independent retailer or you like supporting independent retailers, you can also find the bookstore near you that carries it Go by going to IndieBound, I-N-D-I-E-B-O-U-N-D dot com, and that will tell you the local bookstore in your area that carries the history of gangster rap. That's awesome. So we've been talking to Soren Baker. Soren, hey, thanks for taking time out to talk to us, and we'd love to hear about a local boy made grid. Yeah, well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Tim. All right, thanks, Soren. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.